Galatians chapter 1. Um, 2 Corinthians, Paul mentioned it once. Galatians, Paul mentions it three more times about another gospel. And he basically, he says it's not another gospel. The, fr the phrase gospel means good news, good tidings. And it's not good news if... I'm still getting messages saying nobody can hear me. All right. Anyway, I, we're going to go on. Um, Galatians chapter 1. My head's all rattled now. Paul said in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. There it is. Paul left Romans, um, not Romans, the book of Acts. Paul is telling everybody, he said, Okay, all right. Uh, on Facebook, I'm perfect. Imagine that. Do what? As I smile, yeah. Uh, Paul had mentioned, Paul had told everybody, he said, as soon as I'm gone, grievous wolves are going to enter in. And that's exactly what happened here. So, he said, I marvel you so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Underline that in your Bible. Right, make a bumper sticker of that. There would be some that would pervert the gospel uh, of Christ. And here's what I'm finding. In the age of social media and the age where everybody's got a big mouth. and on the, the internet gives everybody a real big mouth. Have you ever noticed that? Whereas cults and those with every other kind of weird gospel, they found no way of disseminating that. Now on the internet, they can find disciples, draw men unto themselves all over the world. They're getting YouTube hits. They're getting uh, Facebook hits. They're getting, they're getting popular. They're making money because they monetize their, their YouTube videos and everything else. They're trying to get... And what they say is, I have the real gospel. No, I have the real gospel. No, I have the real gospel. Mike Hoggard teaches you a false gospel. I have the real gospel. So every man's a liar, right? So how do we know? How do we know who's telling the truth and who's lying? This is, there you go. This is the reason why I keep pushing and pressing the standard. There's a standard. There's a, there was a, well, I, I painted houses, and there was a standard for painting houses. We'd go to the paint store, somebody would give us a, something about this big that they wanted matched, color matched for paint. So we would go to the paint store and say, can you guys match this? And they'd put it in their little machine, and all of a sudden it would draw, they've got, I don't know how many, 30 some odd different colors of different additives to add to paint and they were all measured out precisely so that and they when they mix the paint they would put it on a label they do this over at Home Depot they put it on a label and they write down all their numbers so that if we needed more of that same amount of paint we go back to that place show them the numbers and they go okay and they dial it up make the exact same amount of paint with the exact same colors I didn't know there was 400 different colors of white it's white for crying out loud, amen. Well, actually, with us, it was antique white because it covered better. But anyway, um, there is a standard, there is a precision about the Bible, and there should be. Because if everybody is drawing from a different source, those sources, to varying degrees, are going to have different Gospels. Because the Bible is the Gospel. Am I saying that right? How do we know I'm saying that right? First Peter. Turn first Peter. First Peter chapter one. Verse 
Let's do verse 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. See, right there he says, you got to obey the truth. And so people would draw out this little passage here, this one little micro clip of words, and say, see, you have to obey in order to be saved. Obeying the truth, what does that mean? Okay, I can, I'll probably teach a lesson on what New Testament obedience is. New Testament obedience is, according to the Apostle Paul, is believing. And he quoted Isaiah 53 when it said, Who hath believed our report? And Isaiah 53 was everything that happened to Christ on the cross before it happened to Christ on the cross. So, here's the question. What if somebody only had the Old Testament? I haven't asked the question yet. Could they, be, could they believe and be saved? Yes. Because how did, how did Abraham receive righteousness? He believed God and it was imputed unto... That's Old Testament verse, not a New Testament one. Isaiah said, who hath believed our report? And that is what happened to Christ on the cross before it ever happened. You got something else? P uh, uh, Philip was reading. I thought he was going to bust like a big pimple back there. The eunuch, the eunuch had, was reading Isaiah 53. He was reading the Old Testament. Is the gospel contained in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Everywhere you see a, a lamb sacrificed, everywhere where God said, trust what I say, believe what I say, every place like that you see the gospel before it ever happened. The Bible describes Jesus as the lamb being slain from the foundation of the world. And there are, some, I want to call them brothers, but they, they nitpick and pinpoint that Christ only died at this certain time, so therefore, it's not possible for anybody to be saved by Christ and the gospel before, let's just say, A.D. 33, although I know that's not the year. But they say that any time before A.D. 33, Nobody could have been saved by the gospel because Christ hadn't died yet. And yet the Bible establishes that his slaying was from the foundation of the world. Which basically, in essence, covers who? Covers everybody. Everybody that believed. When was Noah saved? After the flood? During the flood? As he walks onto the ark? Noah was saved at some point. Because in Genesis 6, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace was God's unmerited favor given to Noah. Did Noah work first or believe first? God gave him the instructions for the ark. Noah could have just sat down, drank his wine, and said, Well, eat, sleep, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. That's not what he did. He saved his whole family because he believed what God said about what was coming and that caused him to act upon it. See, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, muddy up the waters of the book of James either where he talks about faith and works. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works, in my opinion, is no faith. You're here because you believe. And I've, and I've told people this. There are no atheists who come to this church that I'm aware of. That attend regularly, say amen, and pay tithes and support this church. None of them. Why? They don't believe me. They don't believe in God. They're doing what they believe in. And that's the point of what James was trying to say. Because he said, you show me your faith without your works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. How can you show faith if you really don't believe 
in what you told everybody you believe in. See, if you don't really believe it, it'll come out of you. It'll come out in the deeds that you do. You believe in good works, then somebody comes to you who's needy, who, who needs food, they need water, they need gas, whatever it is they need, and you say, go in peace. You don't believe, you don't believe in good works, you don't believe in anything. You're a liar. And that's the whole point. Noah did what he believed in. And nobody else believed what Noah believed in, else they'd have been sitting on that ark when Noah got on. They would have said, Noah, we believe you. Noah, we trust you. Thief on the cross. Thief on the cross. When you're tied up to a tree, what sort of work of righteousness can you perform in order to be saved? See, that's, this is where we are right here. When it comes to works of righteousness, our hands are tied. So here is Paul, and he said it after the cross. Paul said, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So here's the thief on the cross. And he says, Lord. Lord. He calls Jesus Lord. Nobody else there putting him on the cross is calling him Lord, especially not the other thief. He says, if you be the Son of God. Okay? That's the other thief. This one says Lord. And then he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He already believed before Jesus died that Jesus was going to die and he was going to rise from the dead and have a kingdom. He already believed it. So, he qualifies, does he not? He, didn't, he couldn't do this. He couldn't. They didn't splash him with holy water. They, nothing. No work of righteousness can the thief on the cross do. He is sentenced to death as a thief for crying out loud. And he's saved. And I had a woman in this church years ago, back in the 80s, arguing. She said, Pastor, I don't believe in deathbed confession. I went, what? And she said, no, you've got to live this life. I'm going, thief on the cross didn't live any life, but he was a thief. When did God find him? When he was yet a sinner. Christ died for him. Did it before. Before Christ's death, not after. Not even after his resurrection. And I'm, I'm saying things because I know in my mind what I have read and what I've encountered and how I in this church have been accused by other people who should be our brethren who have accused us of not believing or preaching the wrong gospel. And some of these, some of these say that there is more than one gospel in the Bible. That's when I get mad. Okay? Your background knows it, Ryan. Okay? I know these guys. Brother George, you probably know some of them. They say there's more than one gospel in the Bible. And they get really, really adamant about it. And I get, never mind. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, that's what we're going to do. You're in the right place at the right time. Okay? So, here's what I want you to do. Turn to Luke 4. Luke 4. I wasn't done with 1 Peter, was I? No, you turn to Luke 4. And then hold that spot and go back to 1 Peter. Being born, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So first of all, if you're writing this down, Laura, write down the gospel. The gospel causes one to be born again. Okay? You can write that down. There's, there's what the gospel does and what the gospel is where the gospel is found, all of these are important here, okay? So this under the category of what the gospel does. It causes man to be born again. Man is not born again of his own will. Or else man could just say, I am born again. I born myself again. But that's not how it happens. 
The, the very word here is being born again. That implies that it's the work of someone else producing the, the new man in you. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. So the seed, which is the word of God, that's what he says, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The, what, what produces the new man, what produces or causes one to be born again, is an incorruptible Bible. An incorruptible Bible, an incorruptible word, <clears throat> excuse me, an incorruptible seed. You can put all of these words as adjectives, but they mean the exact same thing. Your Bible. Because he says, all flesh is grass and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth and flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The gospel must be preached from the word. That's the gospel. It must be preached from the word. If I come in here and I'm using all these other words out of the, out of the world to try to lead you to Christ, but I don't give you the word of God, you're not saved. And neither can you be saved. It's, it's like thinking that a child can be, see, can be conceived with no father. Does that make sense? Even Jesus had a father. And it was God. Jesus himself was conceived by way of his father. But it would be like saying that a child is conceived without a father. That's not possible. So can a person be saved without the seed of the word of God? Can a person be born again without the seed of the word of God? The answer is no. Cannot be. Okay? So, you know, some of, the, some of these girls in times past, maybe even now, you know, end up in trouble, pregnant. Who's the father? Well, there isn't one. Sorry. A lady wrote in to Dear Abby years ago and told Dear Abby that her child was without any man. And Abby said, now nah, you're lying, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's not possible. You're lying, okay? So it has to be with the word. The word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So, uh, back at Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He's going to define the gospel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Uh, and he's quoting from Isaiah 61, so turn there. And you're going to see a difference in words. And it's not because there's a contradiction in the Bible, it's because there is a definition in the Bible. One is defining the other for you. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. That's the definition of the word gospel. Good tidings. Are you writing that down? I ought to start giving tests in Sunday school. Little quizzes. What's the definition of the gospel? Good tidings. Where is that from? Isaiah 61, 1. So, let's take this phrase, good tidings. Isaiah 40, verse 9. O Zion, thou that brings good tidings, get thee up into the, in the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up. Be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Isaiah 41, 27, the first shall say to Zion, behold, behold them, I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. Okay, now, turn to Luke. Uh, let's see here. Turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. The exact same phrase was used. What did the angel say to the shepherds? Verse 10. The angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you what? Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to how many? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Okay? So the angels brought forth the gospel. They brought forth good tidings because they said unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And these good tidings are for all. I have no idea what John Calvin did with this verse. John Calvin 
did not believe that the gospel was for everybody. He did not believe that salvation was offered to all mankind. He did not believe that. In order to not believe that, you've got to do some serious correcting of God's word in order to get that doctrine through. Why do people believe what John Calvin said? I couldn't care less what John Calvin said. He was not an apostle. He was not in a prophet. I don't, a prof, I don't have to listen to him. What I do have to listen to is what the Bible says. Amen? So who does it go to? John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, who? Whosoever. Not a limited atonement, not a limited group of people, but whosoever believeth in him. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The whole world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Every living creature. And then let God save whom he will. But our responsibility is to preach the gospel. So, Laura, John three sixteen. Okay, there's a reason why that verse is so revered and so regarded. It, in essence, encapsulates the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, what? Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's, that, if you, now, you know me. I don't just teach one verse and then the rest of it's me. We're going to have, I'm going to, I'm going to bolster John 3, 16 with every other verse that I can find as evidence. But John 3, 16 encapsulates the entirety of the gospel. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he is God's only begotten son. So, all the other modern translations do not call him only begotten son. Should there be an issue with that? Begotten came from the Father. Okay, look up um, in Genesis 5. You see a list, it's real simple. Genesis 5. Verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Begat. Okay, now, to ask me to explain how Christ is the begotten of the Father, I can't. What I can tell you is, that's who he is. He came from the Father. There's no doubt that he came from the Father. He was not created by the Father. That's very important. Okay? Because if he was created by the Father, then Christ is not God. Lucifer was created by God. You and I were created by God. Okay? So, there's a lot in that, but the King James Bible says it right. Only begotten of the Father. Only begotten Son. Period. The end. Believe in him. Trust in him. That there is your gospel. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I covered that. Luke 10. Back to Galatians chapter 1. Let's, let's close it off. Everybody's wanting to come in. So, okay. Galatians chapter 1 is going to be the starting point. Not next week. A uh, young man, Brother Charles Scott, is coming up from Harrison, Arkansas. Good young man. Uh, he comes highly recommended. Brother uh, Mike Hutzel is the one who recommended him to me. And he's going to be your Sunday school teacher next Sunday. You better be here because I'll be watching. Okay? And if I see you playing with stuff, I'll think, well, at least they're in church. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for being our good God. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus, your only begotten son, to us. Thank you, God, for allowing us and giving us the gift of faith whereby we trust in you and we trust only in you thank you for the gospel 
Lord, help us to teach it right, to preach it right, to show forth the world, God, that there really is good news out there. There really is a good way to live and a good way to have eternal life. And Father, help us to preach it to the poor. And Lord, what I have in my heart is help us, God, to preach it to people who tried everything and nothing worked. And they are poor in spirit. They're bankrupt because they've tried every form of righteousness and every religion and found no salvation. Father, help us to preach the gospel to those poor people who need righteousness. Father, bless your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.